Everyone ready? Well, good afternoon. It's great to see everyone. I know uh, I think I speak for everyone in Tennessee. We're uh, looking forward to tomorrow, our first practice. But, uh, you know, kind of push the rewind button a little bit. We just concluded our winter uh, off-season strength and conditioning program. Uh, I thought we took great strides, uh, but our team still continues to be work in progress. We still have a long way to go in terms of getting our strength levels uh, where they need to be, our endurance, uh, to be able to play a, a the tempo and the style of football that we want to play. But I tell you what, our kids have done a great job. Uh, Dave Lawson, Mike Sertian, uh, Brandon Miles, and our entire strength coach, uh, strength staff did an excellent job of really preparing our players. And that's the big thing is, is they kind of turn the team now over to us. And, uh, you know, we've had brief, we've had limited uh, interaction with our players, but uh, every opportunity that we had uh, from a compliance standpoint to work with our football team team uh, we have. You know, I think the big question is what do you want to accomplish in spring football? Um, there's a number of areas that we want to accomplish and I think the big thing is just developing our overall standard, you know, our standard of play. And uh, you can't take anything for granted. It's like today we went out and uh, we just walked around the practice fields and so when our players hit the ground running tomorrow they know where we're at, the individual periods, transitions, you know, the standard and expectations by which we're going to first and foremost begin to develop this football team and that's on the practice field. Um, you know, I think the mental and physical preparation that it takes to, pre to prepare yourself for 15 practices, um, you know, that's going to be critical. Uh, pride in our performance, you know, standard in our performance. We're looking for individuals who consistently perform at a championship level and I think that's a big word is consistency in everything that we do from the way we meet, by the way we lift, to the way we practice uh, and the way we play the game, I think a team togetherness, you know, uh, team building, team chemistry uh, is all relative to winning. And, uh, you know, a lot of people say corny phrases, all this and that. You look at any coach, they use them. And uh, it's the team that buys in. It's the team that believes in them. You know, we always talk about it's better to be a player coach team than a coach coach team in terms of team togetherness. And uh, we're developing that brotherhood. Uh, we're developing that family each and every day. Um, and it's just our overall identity, you know, our style of which we're going to play. And again, you know, we graduate a lot of production on the offensive side of the football. You know, who's going to be our playmakers? And so, again, it's just you can never take anything for granted. It's a style of play. You know, it's the way in which we're going to play. Uh, and, then, and then you get into your schemes. And, uh, you know, before we can throw a lot at them, we're going to teach them how to practice. We're going to teach them the way we want to play. And then the schemes will come. I believe in execution. Um, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, anybody and everyone in their, in their offense, Offense has cover two beaters, cover four beaters, cover one beaters. You know, every defense has great schemes. You know, special teams have great schemes, but do your players execute it? And do they know it? You know, what do they own? You know, by the end of practice 15, I want to know what we own in all three phases in the development and the mental toughness uh, that it takes to play the football uh, style that we're going to play here at Tennessee. So with that, um, you know, I'll answer any questions you may have. Coach, for the first time in a couple of years, there's a true quarterback uh, competition. How will you and your staff handle that battle going into spring and beyond? Well, not just the quarterback position, but we'll grade each, every day, you know, and it's going to be a plus or minus. Uh, so everything will be charted. Everyone, everything will be detail oriented. Uh, you know, I talked about it is consistency, consistency in your performance uh, each and every day, and especially the quarterback, you know, the individual who manages the offense the best, makes the least amount of mistakes, but really the individual who gives us the be best opportunity to win come Saturdays will be our starting quarterback. I was wondering if you could talk about some of the position changes we saw on the, the roster. Uh Devon Young being one, and maybe Brent Ruler. Yeah. Uh, Devon Young, uh, who was a running back in the past, uh, we moved him to slot receiver, and so Devon uh, will get some repetitions in the slot, and we'll move him around a little bit. Uh, you may see him at running back as well, but right now he's getting the full-time repetitions that he needs to learn the position at slot. Uh, Brent Brewer is an individual who we moved to linebacker. Brent's done a great job. Uh, he's had a tremendous spring. Uh, another individual who we made a decision the last couple days is, an, uh, is a true freshman, Corey Vereen. 
Uh, we moved him to our Leo defensive end position. So while uh, you know we need some disruptive, quick twitch uh, playmakers on the edge of our defense, so uh, we'll look to him as well. Jacqua Smith. Uh, we'll be more at our Leo defensive line position as well. Justin King at tight end, just to name a few. So um, I'm very, very encouraged by what I've seen with Brent so far. He's doing a great job. But you've talked about how your previous stops as a head coach has helped you prepare for this. How specifically does it help you manage a spring game? Well, you know, I walked out and, uh, you know, you learn by trial and error. That's just like today walking out and walking through the practice structure and the practice format and them understanding where they're going. But I think also our coaches have been there. They've done this. We've worked with each other for so many years that it's like riding a bike. And I really think that's why the transition has really been seamless. And uh, so they've done a great job in our players and in our skill development. Uh, they know where they're going. And I told all of our players tomorrow when the horn blows, if you don't know where you're going, just run in place and follow your position group. So you guys may see a lot of people running in place tomorrow. But, uh, you know, I feel a sense of energy, and they should. You know, this is what we do. You know, we're here to be student athletes. We're here to go to class, get a degree, and play football. And, you know, the weight room is critical in the evolution of our team and the development of each and every player. But when you get to play football, there should be a passion about it, and there should be an energy level that you can feel on the practice field. But I think our goal and our challenge is everyone's going to be excited for tomorrow. Where are we at in our leadership when it comes practice number 9, number 10, number 11? And then the other thing is our overall depth. You know, everyone wants to crown you know, our offensive line, you know, they haven't done anything yet, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, all we've seen them is run around in shorts. I will tell you this, we've asked a lot of individuals to lose weight, and they've done that. They're extremely prideful. They're very competitive. But I want to know, you know, who our number six is, who our number seven is. I think that's probably more the storyline of anything that we have to identify as coaches is our overall depth in all three phases. Coach, a lot of guys on, especially on defense, coming back from injuries, how much work do you expect guys like Latroy Lewis, Kurt Majit, Christian Harris to be able to get this spring? Well, everyone you mentioned all but Kurt Majit will be participating in spring football. So uh, Kurt Majit will be out. Uh, he'll gain a lot of mental reps. He also needs to continue to develop his body, so he'll have a lot of time with Coach Lawson in the strength room. And then, uh, you know, Tiny Richardson will, will, uh, will be able to pick our spots in practice, so he'll practice us a little bit, but you know, between Kurt and then uh, Jalen Reeves, Maven, those will be the two individuals that won't participate in spring this year. But it looked like uh, there was a lack of team speed on defense a year ago. Do you think that's a major concern, or do you think some of the appearing to be a lack of team speed might have been players trying to adjust the system, and so they actually played slower than they were? Well, it's a combination of both. You know, we use a term we can't let the mind tie the feet up, and that's why I talk about we're going to be have an execution-based system, and uh, you have to learn to walk before you can run. That's why we're going to take our time with the installations. We're going to teach our our style of play and we're going to build that confidence and uh, we'll continue to grow but it's all what our players can do we're not going to ask our players to perform something that they can't do but make no mistake about it uh, competing in the fastest conference in all of college football uh, we do have to improve our overall overall team speed in all positions and uh, you know you try to improve that obviously in the offseason but also through recruiting as well what kind of evaluation have you been able to make so far about looking at your quarterbacks, the candidates, who fits, who doesn't, whatever? Well, it's extremely hard right now because, you know, even our skill development sessions, you're not allowed to use a football. And uh, so I'll know more. Uh, again, it'll be work in progress practice one all the way through practice 15 but really you know it's like I told our team today even in Pascali you know I'm not a big fan of Pascali Pascali's a driving range and I bet you if you and I went out on the golf course and we went on the driving range uh, and take this the right way, you'd probably hit them right down the fairway and then we'd go play a round of golf and you may be in the woods a little bit. At least that's my golf game. And uh, that's similar to Pascali is you know there's no uh, 
you know, there's no pass rush. They know we're passing. Um, you know, they know they have all day. Now all of a sudden you put an offensive line and they got to find the throwing windows. They got to move their feet. They have to reset in the pocket. So we will do an inordinate amount of team repetitions this spring to really identify uh, not only who our quarterback is, but who can make plays and who can rush the passer as well. You know, we talked about team speed and everyone wants to talk about our secondary, but really the byproduct of, of a great secondary play is really winning up front and impacting the quarterback. Which when you think about the term buying in, can you see if the guys have bought in yet or is that something you look for later in the spring? I guess how do you measure? Well, I think, you know, everyone wants to use the term buy-in. I think buy-in is in direct correlation to commitment. You know, what's your commitment level? What's your commitment to winning? You know, what's your commitment to being a better football player each and every day? What's your commitment to your teammates? What's your commitment to the University of Tennessee? You know, and our players have been outstanding. They've done anything and everything that we've asked of them. You know, we've challenged them in the classroom. We've challenged them in the weight room. We've challenged them in skill development. And they've done a great job. But now this is the next phase. This is spring football. And it's going to be challenging. You know, we have to get tougher as a football team. You know, there's a lot of things that we have to, to make great, great, significant strides. And uh, it starts with practice one. There's not a whole lot you can do without pads. Football was meant to be paid, played in pads. But I really, I met with our seniors yesterday. And uh, our players have been outstanding. We haven't had anyone late for team meetings. We haven't had anyone late for workouts. And to me, that's commitment. And the other thing is they're holding each other accountable. That's part of the Vol Olympics. But I've liked what I've I've seen so far. Coach, is that easier to do when you've got a team that hasn't won, and hasn't experienced success, that maybe they follow as opposed to inheriting a team that you had some of your previous stops who have been, you know, in conference champions, been in the you know, PCS Bowl? Is there pluses and minuses from that standpoint? Yeah, there is. There is pluses and minuses. And uh, I think this is a hungry football team. But I think at the end of the day, it comes down to leadership. You know, it comes down to your senior class. It's like I told our seniors, you know, I've never been a part of a very successful football team that didn't have a strong senior class. And the hourglass is turned over for them. You know, they have 12 opportunities left, working to get 13, working to get 14. And so every opportunity is critical. But I think it's a byproduct of leadership. Uh, expectations um, and what I've seen from this football team is they want to win but we have to learn how to win you know that you know we talk about being a champion and it's being a champion every day it's how you represent yourself it's it's how you think it's your thought process and uh, it's you know I, I told our players this is just think if every individual takes accountability for their individual improvement if we collectively into uh, improve individually is we will collectively improve as a football team. You know, if Justin Worley's a better quarterback, we're a better football team. Is Nathan Peterman's a better quarterback, we're a better football team. So we can go on and on. So everyone has to take ownership in their individual uh, performances this spring and gets back to what I said, pride in your performance and really learning how to play winning football at your position. The three guys. The job, were you more concerned about physically or mentally approach? Both. Yeah, I can't. I don't think you can have one without the other. And uh, so much of the game is mental. You know, the mental preparation, the mental intensity, the mental effort that it takes. You know, the, the effort. Our players better know what 63 is. Four to six seconds, three great efforts. Because that's the way we're going to play. And I told them if they don't live up to that standard, they won't play. They're responsible for building their own identity. You know, that's the great thing with a new coaching staff coming in is there's unbiased opinions. You know, they're proving to us each and every day by the way they practice, the way they represent, the way they win in the classroom. So, you know, I think that's the big thing is they understand and they should know by now the standard and expectation by which we're going to play. The three guys that y'all have selected to meet with the media today, are those three leaders that have emerged in your short time here? They have. And, uh, you know, leadership is a skill that you have to improve on daily. And like I said, you know, Team 117, this team continues to be work in progress. We're not any way ready uh, for Austin P. You know, what we have to do is we have to win the day tomorrow. We have to be 1-0 and walking off the practice field and being a better football team. And then you'll see throughout the course of spring – 
it's my job to put these individuals in our entire team in positions where leadership has to step up. I have to put them in leadership situations. You'll see the way we practice, I call it controlled chaos because a football game is controlled chaos. You never know, you know what's expected. Great teams, great teams that have leadership can answer sudden change opportunities. You know, um, that's the first thing I look at is, you know, what's our percentage of holding a team to a field goal on defense when we have a sudden change opportunity. So we will practice all those. How do you define, I mean, I've heard that in the video, how do you define control chaos? Just the Things react. flying everywhere, but we're in control. Um, you know, you may see uh, in the middle of practice, we're in team periods and the noise comes on. But it may be annoying, uh, annoying noises. It may be a baby crying. It may be glass breaking. It may be trying to break, you know, their, their, uh, their intensity trying to break their focus because great teams, especially in this conference, have to go on the road and win, you know, and all the clutter and distractions. So really getting them to focus on the bullseye, focus on the task at hand and eliminate the clutter. You know, so many uh, teams nowadays get so caught up in the clutter and the outside distractions and really just focusing on the task at hand. Coach, um, just for the sake of a starting point in the fall, do you end spring with a depth chart of any kind? Not just in relation to the quarterback, but I guess all the positions and how much of a competitive <laughs> atmosphere then do you bring to spring practice because of that? Well, we will. You know, we'll end spring with a depth chart, but again, all that does is it tells us who lines up first when fall camp arrives. You know, because again, you know, they're probably the most significant gains in the weight room will occur over the, the, the summer months. You know, but right now, you know, that'll just be a, a lining up, but we're going to compete every day when the pads go on. We'll have a winner and a loser. Uh, and we'll have sides of the ball. So every rep counts, that's the theme, every rep counts. So uh, we'll have a scoreboard out in the field. And so if we're in a one-on-one -on -one battle, you win, it's a plus point for the offense or the defense. And then we'll tally them up and there'll be a winner and a loser. The winner will wear the orange jerseys, the loser will wear the white jerseys. And everything is about competitive greatness, a great competitive spirit. But uh, you know, everyone says, well, why do you line up at the 50 yard line and run your theme team through and shake hands at the end of practice? Because when the when the whistle blows and we step out in the green, I want them competing each and every day. But when that double horn blows and it's over with, there's no offense, defense. It's one Tennessee. And so that's what we do. We shake hands and let each other know we're still on the same team, but I want them competing on every single rep. Who's mentioned when, is winning the first practice realistic? Is coming off the practice field tomorrow really realistic? In your mind, what you want to do, or do you temper? You really have to temper what your expectations are. Well, I think you temper it, but yeah, we're, we plan to be one and zero, and there's only so much. You know, I think I know where you're going with it. There's only so much you can do in helmets. You know, but I think the big thing I want to see is I want to see the attention, the detail, the small details, you know, the fundamentals, the stance, the starts. I want to see how much they can retain from the meetings. You know, I want to see how much our players can take, you know, the meeting room, the classroom setting to the to the field and apply it. You know, we call that functional intelligence. So I want to see how they can handle that. I want to see how they've mastered their craft, their technique from skill development. And it'll be a complete change to what they're used to in terms of the skill development now going into practice but those are the things I want to see you know I want to see how we can execute the plays that we've installed but I also want to see our leadership you know I want to see our effort I want to see us running the football but when we go team it's only going to be three steps up front you know so we won't be able to gauge a lot but I think we can gauge more the mental capacity than anything the first two practices Going back to the quarterback competition, is there any sort of timetable for when you want to know who your starter is and will those true freshmen have a shot? Everyone, you know, you know, and that's the big thing is uh, it'll be an ongoing process, you know, one through 15 and into the summer months. And you know what, uh, probably a week at, you know, in the spring football, I may be able to give you a little more of an update where they're at right now. But uh, I've been encouraged by everything that I've seen out of our quarterback position so far. What made uh, Robert Gillespie a good fit for the staff? What did you like about him? Uh, boy, I had uh, a checklist, and uh, we interviewed a lot of a lot of candidates, but he was by far the best candidate. Uh, he fit the profile that we were looking for, and it's the same profile we had initially, is I want a good person. I want a, per a person uh, who has great character. Um, that's Robert. I wanted a great family man. 
that's Robert. Uh, I wanted an individual who was a great teacher. I said there's a difference between a teacher and a presenter. I wanted a great teacher. That's Robert. I wanted an individual who could recruit that really understands the dynamics of the SEC in the recruiting nature, also recruiting areas have. But I just wanted the best football coach, the best fit for the staff, and uh, I'm, I'm excited to add him uh, to the staff. You know, my ties, I relied on my ties at West Virginia, uh, the people there who I know uh, that maybe, I know that maybe he did not know that they knew me. Um, and uh, like I said, and I wanted somebody who had a passion and excitement to be here. And, you know, right when he walked in, he started telling the story about being the visitor on the opposite sideline. He started talking about the goosebumps of playing in Neyland Stadium. And then I liked it when he told me he never got the ball in the checkerboards when he played here. So he slipped on the two or three yard line. So I liked that too. So he said the first thing he's going to do when we practice in Neyland is run to the checkerboards. But uh, I just thought he was a great fit for everything that we're working to build here. How much can he potentially benefit you in recruiting with his ties in South Carolina, Florida, Mississippi, throughout the South? Well, oh, tremendous amount. And uh, I, I made sure I called a lot of high school coaches as well. You know, tell me about, you know, one of the things I do is I call a lot of the high school coaches and I say to them, tell me the best recruiter. Who's the best recruiter that comes in your, in, in your school? And I kept hearing Robert Gillespie, Robert Gillespie. And then I'd say, well, tell me why. And they would tell me all the characteristics uh, that we're looking for. I think the other thing is his offensive background. You know, being, in, being uh, you know, at Oklahoma State, being at West Virginia. You know, on his interview, he came in and, you know, Coach Jake will tell you, he brought a lot to the table right away with his experience and his different ideas of, of being uh, in some very good offensive systems. And I competed against him, you know, so I knew what we were getting from a competitive standpoint. Coach, how do you balance maybe trying to, to learn your new team, how they need to be coached, what their strengths are, and, and installing what you guys want to do on both sides of the ball? Well, it's a great balance. And, it's, you know, it's like I said when we opened the press conference is we're going to teach them our standard and expectations by which we're going to play first. I think that's critical. But obviously the scheme is critical too, but it's the small details. You know, I think what separates coaching is really the ability to see that the fine details, the small details, right when they occur. You know, I want instant correction on the football field. You know, I want our players after practice one walking off the football field knowing that they've been coached, you know, on every single snap. And uh, as much effort as we demand from our players, uh, we demand uh, from our uh, coaching staff as well. And I love it. Probably the most prepared group in our football program right now is our equipment staff. Uh, I walked out there today and they had about five pages of notes of talking with the people at Cincinnati. So they're ready to go. Anything else? What's your philosophy on special teams as far as uh, having starters or, or not? We're going to play the best players on special teams. And uh, if there's a starter, he's going to play on special teams if he can help us win a championship. And I think if you go back and you look at the staple of our programs in the past, uh, one common element is we played winning special teams. And I told our staffs this, if it's an offensive or defensive starter, I'd rather have them miss one rep on offense or defense than miss a rep uh, on special teams. But I think the other thing is, you know, loss in this mix is everyone wants to talk about offense, defense, but I'm glad you brought it up. Everything also is identifying your special teams performers. You know, the individuals who are going to help you win championships, and that's understanding your role. We use a, a, a term called IRU, indisputable role understanding. And everyone that runs out in the football field tomorrow has a role in helping us win a championship here and win championships here. So I think, you know, special teams is a big part of it. Um, it's in our practice every day. Uh, we're installing two, uh, two f uh, facets, our kickoff return and our punt team. And we'll practice those for the first five practices. We'll master those techniques. And then we'll graduate and we'll move on to the next phase of special teams. Are the first two practices in just helmets, Thursday Correct. will be in pads. And then do you all plan on scrimmaging Saturday? Yeah, uh, the first two practices are in helmets. Uh, and then our third practice will be in full pads. We will scrimmage on Saturday, but we're not, there'll be situational scrimmages. There'll be controlled situational situations throughout practice, but there'll also be fundamental improvement. We, we have to work on our fundamentals each and every day. And so never we just roll the balls out and just go. You know, we may do that one time all spring, but
But, you know, we need to practice special teams. We need to get good at, at what we do and, and work on owning different things with our techniques. Coach, with so much new stuff going in, and especially with the, the quarterback and the experience level there, did you bring back, how important or how beneficial is it to have that much experience up front on the offensive line with you know, cohesion unit guys that are used to communicating with each other? Well, it is. You know, it's big when you have an experienced offensive line like we have. And uh, I've relied on them a lot. They've done a great job. And, uh, again, I'll know a little bit more after practice number three when the pads go on. But, you know, our offensive line, just like every position, has done a great job. But, obviously, having the experience back up front, especially in this conference, uh, is very comforting. But the, the thing I'm uncomfortable with right now is who, again, our depth. You know, who's going to be number six? Who's going to be number seven? Every player is one play away. And so if you look at the great football teams, um, in, in their role understanding is the next man in theory is there can be no drop off. You know, if, if number four in the offensive line goes down and number seven goes in, there can be no drop off. And when we have that, we'll have a very successful football team and successful football program. Coach, when it comes to schemes, do you throw everything at them and then see what they grasp, or do you gradually spoon feed them and then add on? We're going to gradually move on. Um, you know, we're, we're going to we're not going to throw everything at them. I know each each different coaching staff has different philosophies, but because of the style of play that we want to play is, uh, you know, we got to teach them how we're going to play, how we're going to line up, you know, how we're going to finish plays. And we'll gradually move on. But, uh, again, I don't want the mind tying the feet up. And I think the other thing, if you look at our spring practice schedule, it's very conducive to learning. You know, we never practice back-to-back. -back. It's Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. So we always have at least a day off in between so we can kind of go back, improve on our deficiencies, make our improvements, teach, correct off a of film. And I really want to take our time because obviously this spring ball is probably the most critical spring ball we will have here at Tennessee. What you mentioned uh, early on about the, the offensive line and your challenge to never lose weight, it, is that, was that a concern of yours or is that imperative in your style of play or why, why was that brought up, I guess? Well, I, it was a concern a little bit. And, uh, you know, now, you know, there's still over 300 you know but we want them about 305 you know some 310 it's really based on the individual you know we had some guys who we felt were a little overweight couldn't move you know in the tempo by which we want to play um, you know so I think that's critical uh, and then the nature of our offense but we have you know we have a talented group up front and I don't ever want to take their edge away and their strength away but uh, you know we've had individuals uh, you know our nutritionist came to me today and she said coach I've never seen anything like this you know the amount of body fat that our players have lost just in a couple months in in gained weight through muscle is amazing and uh, that's the way we train so you know even though they're losing weight they're gaining muscle and that's what we want you, you know you look at young man I'm extremely proud of Eric Fisher we were on the phone for about an hour the other night you know in the in the strides that he's made to now put himself in position to possibly be the number one pick in the National Football League draft and I think he's a great illustration for all of our linemen in our program and linemen that will recruit in the future in terms of adding the right weight in the body fat composed to the muscle makeup of their bodies but is it conceivable, uh, getting back to the quarterbacks, that one of these true freshmen could come in not having been here in the spring and, and win the job, compete for the job? You know what, that's really hard to say. Um, you know, I'll probably know a little bit better through training camp. I think it's extremely hard really to really expect a true freshman to come in and make a difference. Each individual is differently. So I think that's kind of hard. Um, the thing we have to do, and I told our kids this, is we have to focus on the process. Too many people want to focus on the end result. We just got to focus on the process and that's you know winning tomorrow. You know, And like I said, I've made no mistake. I've made no uh, secret about it. I'm a big believer in the Navy SEALs and uh, part of the Navy SEALs is setting short-term goals, short-range goals, you know, every hour upon the hour and you win those goals and that's the approach that we're taking.
that experience? By the way, I apologize if I uh, called your golf game out, by the way. I'll have a golf game. Let's take one, two more. Does that experience up front take away any of your hesitancy on putting a freshman out there at quarterback against Austin Peay? Well, I will tell you this. It is very comforting knowing that uh, we have a lot of individuals that have played really good football for us in the past. Uh, but again, it's going to come down to the individual who makes, makes the least amount of mistakes, is the manager of the game, takes care of the football, and really puts our offense and our football team in position to win football games. But it, but it is a sense of comfort knowing that uh, you have some individuals that have played a lot of games here and have played well. Two. Is, you, do you have a, is there a prototypical running back for what you like to do? And, and if so, is there someone close to that that you see on your roster? Well, I think when you're uh, establishing your criteria by position, you want different level skill sets. You want different type of skill sets. You know, initially we want an individual who can make you miss. Uh, you know, has the ability to make you miss and not just get what the play's blocked for, but the ability to make plays in space. Uh, an individual who's consistent and reliable and takes care of the football and can make plays. You know, we'd like a complete back, an individual who can pass protect, catch the football out of the backfield, and obviously run the ball. But I also think you need, you know, so you need some shifty guys who can make guys miss in space, but you also need some downhill runners. So I think the big thing is, is, you know, I'll be able to address that question a little bit more, but I think Ray John Neal and Marlon Lane, I do think that their running styles really complement each other. And I've been encouraged by what I've seen from those two. Thank you. Okay, thank you.